has gone from an underdog to now leading this series. Has that changed the psychology in the locker room? Jim, it really hasn't. We still, uh, we still know that we've got a, a very good team over there that we have to beat. So uh, we go out, take it a, a pitch at a time, an inning at a time, and see what we can do. You're surprised, or are you surprised to be in this position? No, we're not. We feel like we've got a good ball club. We feel like you know that we still are the def defending American League champions, and uh, and we go out and every time we step on the field, we step out there to win. So no, we're not surprised. You pushed all the right buttons last night. Witten was in the game. Have you made any changes tonight? Uh, yeah, I hope I push the right buttons tonight. We'll put Giles back in the left field and, uh, and DH uh, Justice and, and leave Wilson at second base. Uh, really the only two uh, deviations from the norm. you got a big uh, game tomorrow as well, and everybody's looking forward. You've elected to go with Chad O.J. instead of Jarrett Wright. Why, and, and, and is Jarrett Wright finished? Well, no, uh, Jarrett's not finished. Uh, Jarrett uh, is still a, a very good pitcher. Uh, we're going with Chad O.J. He matches up well against, against the Yankees, has in the past. He's got good numbers against them. He came in relief for Jarrett the other night and pitched very well at Yankee Stadium. Uh, we'll put Jarrett in the bullpen and use him out of the pen right now, and hopefully we can get to the next round. You didn't throw batting practice today, did you? No, I didn't want to put him in a slump. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck tonight, Mike. Back outside to you, Keith. Jim, thanks, and forget not that Chad O.J. won two of the three games that the Indians claimed in the World Series last year. Well, we're less than 10 minutes from the first pitch here. Bob Costas and Joe Morgan will have that call. Jim Gray and I will join you throughout the action. Last night, of course, plenty of stars for Cleveland, and we continue our tradition of celebrating postseason heroes as Bartolo Colon and Jim Tomey stun the Yankees and rock the baseball world. is the Sun America NBC pregame show. The 1998 American League Championship Series. Tonight, it's game four. The New York Yankees versus the Cleveland Indians. As we welcome you back to the Jake, we can feel a little bit of chill in the air, and there's a chilling prospect tonight for the Yankees. Should they lose this one, they'd go down 3-1, have to win three in a row to make it out of the American League and to the World Series. We welcome Joe Morgan in. Now, obviously, folks, if the Yankees or anybody else loses two straight baseball games, this is baseball, after all, in the regular season, it's not much of a story. But in the playoffs, just about everything else is magnified and that's the case here especially when you've had the best record in baseball over the course of the season why have the yankees not hit of late well one of the characteristics of the yankees so far this season has been their patience at the plate but now they're going out of the strike zone for instance watch this first pitch to jeter he swings at a bad pitch and then later cologne makes a good pitch to get him into hit him to a double play now martinez is really struggling watch the same thing he swings the pitch out of the zone Cologne makes a good pitch and strikes him out. And the top of the order is just not getting on base enough to give Williams and Martinez a chance to drive in some runs. Joe Torre said to me that Derek Jeter is the key. He's going to have to be the catalyst for this ball club. But you contrast that by the Cleveland Indians last night, they were very patient. I mean, they were taking pitches up and out of the zone, as Jim Tomey does here. He gets ahead in the count, and then when Pettit makes a pitch that he can handle, he drives it out of the ballpark. Manny Ramirez, the same thing. He is patient. He gets a pitch that he can hit, hits it over the right field wall. You have to be patient if you're struggling, and I think that's what the Yankees have to start with tonight. Be patient. And they have a chance tonight because Dwight Gooden is more the type of pitcher they face during the season where they could work him deep into the count and get some pitches to handle. Gooden was 8-6 and six for the season. His opponent tonight, Orlando Hernandez, El Duque, won 12 while losing 4 for the Yankees. Somebody asked Hernandez whether or not he was frightened about starting in this game with all the responsibility attached to it. He said, hey, if the Sharks didn't frighten me while I was floating around in the Caribbean trying to defect, the Indians aren't going to frighten me. Game four is next. This is the Sun America NBC pregame show. Sun America, the retirement specialist. Dwight Gooden, the Indian starting pitcher, is only now making his way in from the bullpen. Joe, form has been turned on its head in both league championship series. 
There have been six games played so far, American and National League, and the Yankees, who won 114 during the regular season, and the Braves, who won 106. They each swept through the division series, but now the two favorites, the expected World Series matchup, the Braves and the Yankees, have between them lost five of six in the LCS. Well, I think it just proves one thing. If you can get well-pitched ball games, you can play with anyone. And the Atlanta Braves are one of the best teams in baseball. They've had well-pitched ball games for their team, but they've had well-pitched games against them. And I think that's the same thing you can say about the Yankees. The hitters are going to have to take over this series, in my opinion, for the Yankees. Much has been made of the fact that tonight's Yankee starter, Orlando Hernandez, hasn't pitched in 15 days. He did throw batting practice six days ago in a workout at Yankee Stadium, but the last time he had the ball for real was September 25th. But the same is almost true of Dwight Gooden. His last regular season appearance was September 25th, and then in Game 2 of the Division Series against the Red Sox, he threw only 22 pitches before he was ejected from the game by Joe Brinkman for arguing a play at the plate. So he hasn't had much of a stint in 15 days either. Well, that may work in the Yankees' favor that Gooden had not pitched because the Yankees need to be more patient, show more patience. They're used to working pitchers and getting deep in the count and then getting pitchers to hit. And tonight they're going to have to do that with Dwight Gooden, and I think he will give them an opportunity to do that. Bartolo Colon didn't give them an opportunity. He came right after. You think the fans at the Jake are ready for game four? These are some of the best fans in all of baseball, as we've noted in the past. They drew some three and a half million. There are since to draw over three million every year in this ballpark. Hoping to go to the World Series for the third time in four years. Let's see what Joe Torre has done with his batting order. As Keith and Jim mentioned on the pregame show, there are some changes. Knobloch, Jeter, O'Neill, and Williams. First four are the same. But Chili Davis in the DH spot moves up to fifth. And as you see, during his career against Gooden, he's had much success, most of that when each was in the National League. Martinez is not taken out of the lineup, but he is dropped to sixth. Posada starts at catcher tonight. Chad Curtis is in left field, and Shane Spencer sits. And Brocious will bat ninth. Shane Spencer is one for ten in this league championship series after tearing through the American League in the month of September and hitting two homers against the Rangers in the first round of the playoffs. Well, Dwight Gooden has really come full circle, Bob. When he first came up, he was an overpowering fastball pitcher with a, just a curveball. Now he has a fastball, curveball, slider, and a change. And the slider is now his big pitch, especially against left-handed hitters. You'll see him throw a lot of sliders. The key for him tonight is to try to get ahead in the count and to be able to get his curveball over. The slider he doesn't have to throw strikes with, but he'll have to throw a lot of them. And let's take a look at the defense behind him. Enrique Wilson and Omar Vizquel turned three double plays in the game last night. Bartolo Colon, every time he got a run on first base, he was able to get the ground ball, and they were able to turn it. Giles takes over in left field for hard-hitting Mark Whitten. Yeah, a couple of things worth noting. Hargrove had told us yesterday that Coro would probably play in game four. But Wilson got a big RBI hit, and he liked the way Enrique looked in the field, so he stays in the lineup at second base. And Cora, for the moment, rides the pine. Hargrove also told us he had to think long and hard about taking Mark Witten out, but he likes to use Giles against a right-handed pitcher. Well, I'm still surprised he took Witten out. Knobloch will start it. And the question is still up in the air. Is his bonehead play at the end of game two going to be just a footnote? That's what it will be if the Yankees rally and win this series. Or will it be the turning point, the point at which a dream season began to go sour? After a bit of hesitation, Knobloch stepped up, admitted his mistake, took responsibility for it, and had a good game last night. He swings on the first one and skies it to right. It's carrying well. Ramirez to the track for the catch. From the looks of that ball, safe to say that the ball will really carry tonight out toward right field. Yes, but this is the same problem the Yankees have had before. I mean, Knobloch swinging at the first pitch and hitting a fly ball. That's not working into the count. You've got to find out what Dwight Gooden has. 
the leadoff hitter's job is to make him throw a few pitches so the rest of the team can see what he has on that particular night. But Knobloch hit the ball hard, and he did have a couple of hits last night, and he made some good plays in the field, so he was able to shake off the game two misplay. Well, he had one hit and a gift, but he, he did at least get on base last night. That's right. He had an infield hit that could have been scored an error. Should have been scored an error. <laughs> the throw beat him, clearly beat him, and Tomei dropped it. But he battled back yesterday. He showed a lot of class in the way he handled the diversity from the day before. Two days before, I should say. 2-0 and the count. Larry Young has the plate tonight. Tim Welke at first. Jim McKean at second. The crew chief, Jim Evans, at third. Ted Hendry's on the left field line. And on the right field line, John Shulock. Fouled away. Well, the top of the order, as you mentioned, Knobloch, a couple of hits last night, makes the average look a lot better. But they were really struggling as far as getting on base. You need to get on base a lot of times. You can't just expect to get on base a couple of times and for Tino and Bernie and those guys to pick you up. You have to give them several opportunities to drive you in. That's what the top of the order is for. Breaking ball, tap foul. Gooden can still throw his fastball in the low 90s, between 91 and 93 according to Mike Hargrove, but you've got to watch him once he gets past about 90 pitches or into the fifth or sixth inning. He can lose it quickly at that point. He can still be effective, but he's not the same guy who as a young phenom went 24 and 4 in winning the Cy Young Award in 1985 for the Mets the corner three and two that year Gooden had an ERA of 1.53 and threw eight shutouts he was the rookie of the year in 84 Cy Young Award winner the next year just in his early 20s at that point seemed like the Hall of Fame was a lock it didn't turn out that way the scale glides to his left making it look easy two down Well, that's the pitch that Gooden needs to have to throw strikes with. This is a two and two curveball. And if you can throw the curveball two and two, it will keep the hitters honest. And there's a good rotation. Gets the ground ball. And as you said, anything to shortstop is pretty much a routine out. The curveball, if you you don't have to have a great curveball when you throw it two two. You just have to be able to throw it for a strike, make the hitter swing at it. Up steps O'Neill. With two down and the base is empty. Ball one to him. Last year in the division series, O'Neill had a grand slam home run off Chad O.J. Had a double with two out on the ninth, and the Yankees trailing by one in the last game that narrowly missed going out. Almost brought them back. Impossible not to like the way Paul O'Neill plays the game. He's consistent, he's smart, and he plays hard. Now he's gotten ahead on the count, 2-0. and Ball three. But you can see the difference there in the Dwight Gooden that is pitching tonight as compared to the young Dwight Gooden. The young Dwight Gooden would have come right after him with a fastball. And this time he tries to spot the fastball low and away. Rookie of the year, Cy Young Award winner, and all-star, and no-hitter. I mean, he's done it all, except win a postseason ball game. That one is in there. This is Gooden's 10th postseason appearance. As you say, he's never won in the playoffs or World Series. 0-3. He lost one LCS game as a Met and was twice beaten by the Red Sox in the 86 World Series. The 3-1 pitch is hit high in the air to right. Ramirez to the track, to the wall. It's out of here. Paul O'Neill doesn't need much hitting advice, but maybe he was listening to you. He went deep in the count, just as you said on the pregame show. 
Got into a hitter's count at three and one and rode it out of here into the jet stream in right field. Well, this is when the Yankees are at their best. They're a group of veteran hitters who are not afraid normally to hit with two strikes or a hit behind in the count. But Paul O'Neill is just a good hitter. We said this the entire series. He's one of the most underrated players in the game. Gooden being very careful with him. This is a slider. He's trying to get it down and in, and he does not get it down and in. Watch slider that O'Neill catches before it breaks. And as you mentioned, the wind is blowing to right field. He didn't need a lot of help, but he had a little bit. Bernie Williams bounces it to Vizquel. Omar's second assist of the inning closes it out in the Yankee first. But the solo from O'Neill gives them a 1-0 lead. A 1-0 lead in the top of the first last night and never scored again. That was all Bartolo Colon allowed them, and they lost it 6-1. Here's Mike Hargrove's lineup. Lofton, Vizquel, Justice, Ramirez, Tomey at the top. Fryman hits sixth. Tomey with the two home runs last night. Witten also hit one. Ramirez had a homer and a double that hit the yellow line in straightaway center, narrowly missing a second home run. Giles, Alomar, and Wilson at the bottom of the order against El Duque, Orlando Hernandez. Well, he has a lot of pitches, a variety of pitches, and he throws them from a lot of different angles has a lot high leg kick he hides the ball but it's important for him to be able to get his curveball over the plate Kenny Lofton just one for 15 in this series Brocious almost on top of him at third base to guard against the bunt strike one from Hernandez breaking ball misses As Keith Oberman told you on the pregame show last October, El Duque's brother, LeVon Hernandez, beat the Indians twice in the World Series. A pop-up wide of third. Let's see if it stays in. Brocious back, takes it. And let's take a look at the defense behind Hernandez. We just saw Brocious go over, but Chad Curtis takes over in left field today and plays those Shane Spencer, you know, five errors in 151 games. Spencer likely relegated to pinch hitting duty for the rest of the series, but you never know. But that's what Joe Torre indicated before the game tonight. Vizquel runs up as if to bunt and takes a ball. One scout described El Duque as a combination of Juan Marichal's high kick, Luis Tiant's motion, and Satchel Page's flying limbs. Here's the scouting report on it. Well, he reminds me more of Luis Tiant than anyone. But he needs to have good control with his curveball. We've seen him throw his curveball pretty well so far. But his sidearm curveball is out pitch against right-handed hitters. A little pop into shallow left, sprinting back as Jeter can't get there. A hit for the scale, wide turn at first, but Curtis gets it back in. Well, nothing you can do about this if you're El Duque. The ball is in. And he inside outs the pitch and hits a little flare down the left field line. Jeter gives it a good shot, but no way to make, make the catch. Now David Justice. I think this is the key hitter, as far as I'm concerned, for Hernandez. Justice is a big time guy he likes this kind of stage he's performed well in the playoffs he's performed well in the World Series he loves the stage and he's the guy that had a bad game yesterday so he's looking forward to bouncing back he went 0 for 5 last night Indians didn't need him they won it 6 to 1 fouled away and this is what David Justice has done through the years in the LCS and he's three for 13 this year with a home run. And he had a game-winning hit in game four up in Boston in the division series. 
The 1-1 one, one pitch. But first, Vizquel is chased back. Something else Orlando Hernandez has in common with Satchel Paige. Uncertain age. Nobody ever knew just how old Satch was. Hernandez says he'll be 29 tomorrow. Well, some people, know. well, some people <laughs> guess he might be 32 or 33. No way to know for sure. Swing and a miss. Justice will be followed by Ramirez. Two pitch struck him out. Beautiful pitch there by Hernandez. Took a lot off of that pitch. Change up moving down and away from Justice. Justice trying to pull it, trying to hit the hole on the right side. He hesitates a little bit, as you said, like Satchel Page, and then he throws that change up low and away. Beautiful pitch. Watch the movement. The ball moves low and away, and the speed fools Justice as well. I'm not so sure about the Juan Marichal comparison, though, because when Marichal no. went into his high kick, the leg was more extended. With El Duque, it's more of a tuck. He's got some style out there, though. Here's Manny. Can't catch up with the high heat. He closed the regular season on a tear. At a stretch of eight home runs in five games to finish with 45 for the year. And it's continued into the playoffs, a stage he has always loved. There goes Vizquel. Pitch is high. The throw is not in time. A smart play there by Vizquel. He waited until Justice no longer could use the hole over there on the right side. The left-handed hitting Justice, and then he takes off and steals the base. You can see he's going. He actually made a couple of movements before El Duque releases the ball. But he gets a good jump. Posada comes up and fires to second base, but you can see Vizquel clearly in before the throw gets there. A single to tie the game. With two out, the 1-1 pitch to Ramirez. He drops down and misses outside. Ramirez likes the ball out over the plate. That's why he didn't handle the first fastball up and in. He tried to come up and in on the second pitch. He missed. So he'll try to get him either up and in or he'll try to get him to chase that breaking ball off the plate. Check at first base, and they say he went around. Tim Welke with the call at first. Let's look at it. Well, he swung through the first high fastball. He took the second one, and he comes up and in again. And you can see that this is what Welke sees at first base. You'll see the barrel of the bat. Yeah, that looks like he swung. I mean, I, I'd have to agree. He evens the count at two and two. That's the pattern that El Duque will use against right-handers. He will try to throw the fastball in and then get him chasing something off the plate away on the breaking ball. Man, he got away with one there. That was a breaking ball that stayed right in the middle of the plate. Now watch, he's trying to, after coming in with a couple of pitches, he's trying to throw this slider away but it doesn't get away. It's right there in the middle of the plate, and Ramirez just misses it. Man, it was just sitting there, wasn't Look it? Look at this. I mean, right there, that is a big-time mistake, but hitters do not always hit mistakes out of the ballpark. You can see that ball just kind of rolls right into his zone. Given a reprieve. Hernandez with another 2-2 pitch. Full count. On a 
his hand in the cold weather, asked about pitching in the cold. The Cuban said, remember, we used to tour Europe with the national team. I pitched in cold weather games in Italy and in Ireland. It wasn't exactly warm on that raft either. <laughs> he defected the day after Christmas. Ramirez walks. Joe Torrey told us that he had to issue 32 passes for family and friends. His wife, Allie, is one of 16 children from the Cincinnati area. So there are plenty of brothers and sisters and cousins and aunts and uncles who want to come to the ball game. 32 on Joe's pass list for the weekend in Cleveland. The Yankees had success against Tommy with the breaking ball in and the fastball in in New York. We'll see how they start in here. Inside. And there you see what the middle of that lineup did last night. Look at that. Three for four, two for four, two for three with home runs. And Jim Tommy hit a couple of home runs out of the ballpark last night. So immediately they go inside with a fastball. And that's where they had the success, as I said, in Yankee Stadium. But Jim Tomey's a smart hitter. You're going to have to mix in some breaking balls away. You can't pitch him one way. Here's the 1-0. Sails outside. They throw him a fastball in, and then he tried to go away with a changeup. Now he's working himself, speaking of Hernandez, into an uncomfortable situation. Two on, two out, and down in the count to the very dangerous Tommy, 2-0. and oh. When you're down 2-1 and you're on the road in a series, every pitch is important. So there's a lot of pressure right here. I mean, this is a big situation for the Yankees. A called strike. Torrey said that if the inactivity, not having pitched in 15 days, was going to affect El Duque, you could look for it in the first couple of innings. He felt if he could get through the first two, then he would settle in. When he pitches so far this inning, three balls and a strike. Well, he's got a choice to make here. I mean, do you want to go after Tommy? Do you want to try to make a great pitch? And if you miss, you have Prime and a right-handed hitter coming up with the bases loaded. So they've got to make a choice here. In the top of this inning, Paul O'Neill hit a 3-1 pitch out of the park. Here's the 3-1 to Tommy. He tried to do the same thing. Loosened a couple of buttons on his shirt with that swing. Tommy goes up and out of the strike zone on this 3-1 fastball. El Duque throws it up, and Tommy cannot catch up with it. Good high fastball. No way he can handle that pitch. So Vizquel from second, and Ramirez from first will be running on the pitch. Here it comes. And a long drive to right. O'Neill back to the wall with just enough room. By a whisker, it's still 1-0 New York. Orlando Hernandez escapes the first inning with his 1-0 lead. Chili Davis starts it in the second and takes low from Gooden. Mariano Rivera, perhaps acting as the interpreter, with Mel Stottlemyre, the pitching coach, in between. A chopper toward Vizquel. Fields and throws and gets Davis. Let's take a look at the scouting report for Dwight Gooden. He's got to spot his fastball, and so far he's been able to do that. And he needs to throw his curveball over for strikes, not just be able to throw it and get them to chase it out of the strike zone, but 
first and foremost, he must remain focused against his former teammates. I know his adrenaline is flowing heavily here, but he's got to, you know, stay calm and pitch this ball game and not just try to beat the Yankees. This is the first time a former Met and Yankee has ever pitched against a New York team. Tino Martinez hitless in this series in 13 at bats. Six of them K's. Joe Torre told us about an interesting conversation he saw take place about a week ago as we watched Fernandez on the bench there with Stottlemyre in between him and Rivera. Know the count, so Martinez gets ahead on the count. Well, he showed a little more patience in this at bat than he was doing last night. He was not working deep into the count. He wasn't sitting on pitches. I mean, I think if I'm Joe Torre, I'll let him hit 3-0 here. Well, he walks him on four pitches. Started to tell you about Hernandez talking with Hideki Arabu. Tori said, I looked up, and there's Irabu from Japan and Hernandez from Cuba, both of whom speak through interpreters, and they're talking to each other. Down the right field line, just standing there, so it was a long conversation. No one else in the vicinity <laughs> said, I have no idea what they were talking about or how they were communicating, but they were standing there for quite a while, gesturing, nodding, smiling. They've got their own code, I guess. Here's Posada. One thing Gooden has to be careful of is just don't try to be too fine. You're going to have to trust your stuff eventually, and the early part of the game is the time to do that. In there, one and one. Every pitch does not have to be on the corner. Every pitch doesn't have to be on the edge. Ball is high. Well, you see what the Yankees have done in the division series, 253 and 210 in the first three games of this series. Nine runs in the division series and nine here in three games. Inside the Posada, three balls and a strike. So he walks the slumping Martinez on four pitches. Then falls behind Posada, three and one. Well, he's been behind every hitter, Bob, that didn't swing at the first pitch. He's fallen behind everyone except Knobloch and Williams. Mark Wiley, the pitching coach, charting the pitches. They've already decided to yank Jarrett Wright from the rotation and start Chad O.J. tomorrow in game five. If Gooden is knocked out early, they go to Dave Burba as the long man. Full count now to Posada. See, I, I think right there he trusted his stuff. He just threw the fastball three and one, 92 miles an hour fastball. You have to, there comes a time you just have to say, do I have a good enough fastball to challenge, challenge these hitters? And as I said, the time to do it is early in the ball game, not try to do it in the fourth, fifth, sixth inning. Martinez runs on the 3-2 pitch, which is grounded foul into the Yankee dugout. And that's one of the things that Joe Torre does all the time. He will put a runner in play in motion just to stay out of the double play. Gooden came back with a slider then. He was trying to strike Posada out, but Posada got a piece of it. It always puts pressure on the defense when you put a runner in motion. Someone has to move, and it opens up a hole. He goes again, swing and a miss. Here's the throw from Alomar, way offline. Into the outfield it goes. Martinez pops back up and makes it to third. Strikeout, stolen base, and an error. Well, Alomar had more time than he realized. 
Martinez doesn't get a good jump. He doesn't run well. Watch. I mean, he had a lot of time. You see how far the ball was offline and way ahead of Martinez sliding in. Now watch. He has plenty of time. Ball spills way to the first base side, and even Vizquel can't knock it down. He comes up. Well, he comes straight over the top. It just tails on him. You can see the ball moving away, and Vizquel could not come down with it. So now Chad Curtis in the starting lineup in left field tonight, hitting in the eighth slot, has an RBI chance with two out. Ball one. Couldn't throw a good fastball to Posada to strike him out. So he does have the good fastball tonight. Again, he's just going to have to trust it and throw it. During the season, the Yankees were one of baseball's best in this sort of situation in the postseason just 188 with runners in scoring position 2 and 0 Curtis ended the season in a 4 for 47 slump that and the remarkable September enjoyed by the rookie Shane Spencer put Curtis on the bench for much of the postseason until tonight now it's Spencer's turn to watch A stolen base and an error. Put a man at third with two down on the second. And Gooden struggling with his control falls behind 3 0. Brocious is on deck. Only two of the first eight hitters have had strike one on. Right in there for strike one with Curtis taking all the way. This is the second straight year Dwight Gooden has started the fourth game of a playoff series between the Indians and the Yankees in this ballpark. Said it was game four of the division series for the Yanks against Cleveland last time. A full count. He started against Oral Hershiser, pitched well. The Yankees couldn't hold a lead late in the game. Gooden got a no decision. Two good fastballs in a row. Now it's three and two. See what he comes with. Foul back. Another good fastball. I think Sandy Alomar Jr. is going to try to get in to throw more fastballs. Good location. And good velocity on the fastball. Look at the location. Outer part of the plate. And with some movement. In his early 20s, at his best with the Mets, Gooden combined a wicked fastball with hop on it with a terrific curveball. And he didn't need much more than that, at least for a while. He strikes Curtis out. Martinez is left at third. It's still 1-0 New York. Ryman, Giles, and Alomar in the Cleveland second. A few people have asked, so we'll answer. No, Travis Fryman is not the son or any other relation to Woody Fryman, the former Pittsburgh Pirate left-hander. El Duque deals. Sweeping, breaking pitch for a ball. You hit against Woody Fryman, didn't you? He was nasty on left-handers. Had a good fastball that tailed back in and threw a slider. He, and he threw hard. Also spent time with the Tigers, as I recall it. As did Travis Fryman. The 1 1 pitch is inside. Three. 
That's Jose Cardinal. Bounce foul. Able to decipher that, Joe? No. All right. But it had to do with coming to the set position. Cardinal is the Yankees' first base and outfield coach. Fine big league outfielder himself in the 60s and 70s. Out of play. You don't see many pitchers anymore with a big distinctive windup. So it's fun to watch a guy like El Duque work. Well, a lot of guys are more compact and pitching coaches like that better. Right center field. O'Neill is on the move. And Paul gets there. Folks, the Sporting News has joined the Team NBC Sports has formed for in-depth sports coverage online. You can go inside baseball's postseason at msnbcsports.com. The Sporting News delivers analysis from Astros manager Larry Durker throughout the postseason. The Sporting News, now part of the team at msnbcsports.com. Brian Giles steps in and takes a strike. Those figures you see, you see, are from his game two start. His numbers not unlike those of a lot of hitters. Had problems hitting in these first three ball games. In center field, Bernie Williams. Two flyouts in the Cleveland second. Let's go back to Cardinal and Stottlemyre and listen once again. The only thing I was telling the Duke is that, that he's easy to time and don't let it be scared to time him. You just come in here, look at him, go to his place. Come in here, so hold it up a little bit more and throw. Hold up a little bit long and throw. Either hold it up a little bit less and throw, and then he can break his reader. That's what I thought. We don't talk about it. Now we can tell what he was talking about. Yeah, basically what he's talking about is that he's coming to a set motion and making the same move to the plate with the same time. You know, pause. He's pausing the same time each time he comes to the set position. Making it easy for a base stealer. And what he's saying is he needs to vary that time. He needs to go quick sometimes. He needs to hold it a little longer. And then he can get into his rhythm. and one to Alomar. Quickly 0 and 2, of course, as the Yankees' first base coach. Part of Cardinal's responsibilities is to study opposing pitchers to try and help his base stealers and base runners out. That's true, but he's also, as you mentioned, the defensive coach, so he's helping with the defense. And the defense here says if you get a runner at first, we have to hold him a little closer. Down goes Alomar. And Hernandez settles in with a 1-2-3 second. Still 1-0 Yanks. 1-0 New York as we go to the top of the third inning. Bob, a lot has been made of the fact that the Yankees have no superstars. They're a team of stars. And that's great during the regular season. But when you fall behind and you get in trouble, you need someone to step up. I mean, you need a leader. And I think that's what the Yankees need right now. They need someone to step up and say, I'm the man. Hit your wagon to my horse, and we're going to go someplace. I don't really see that from anyone. The personalities on this ball club are one of, you know, being a team and, and the unity. All that is great. But anytime you get in trouble, someone needs to step up. And it doesn't just happen automatically. You know, Paul O'Neill hit a home run. That doesn't mean that he's going to do that tonight. You have to have someone that the guys know is the leader. And that's one of the things all great teams have. And the Yankees have made a point of saying we do not have a superstar. I mean, you all know who the leader is, you know, when the Bulls take the floor or when Montana was leading a great team. I think all the great teams need that. The team leaders on this ball club seem to be the pitchers like David Wells, 
and David Cohn. Those guys seem to be the guys who always are willing to step up. And it doesn't mean that these other guys aren't leaders or not potential leaders. It just means that someone's going to have to take it upon himself and step forward. When you're in trouble, it's when you need a leader. When things are going great, you can just go along smoothly. The 2-2 two -two to Brochus. Fryman will have a long throw. And he gets it to Tommy in time. Well, on your Cincinnati Red Club, that won the back-to-back -back World Series in 75 and 76, you had a few to choose from. You might do it. Bench might do it. Rose might do it. Or it could be Foster. Well, we always say the man, but in most, in the great cases, it's the men. You want more than one. But I'm just saying that I think that that's what needs to happen here for the Yankees because they are a great team, in my opinion. And they just need someone to say, hey, I'm the man tonight. Let's go do it. Now Block fly to deep right to start the game. Ball strike. When the Yankees won the World Series in 1996, it was two veterans, perhaps past their respective peaks, but still with presence, Cecil Fielder and right. Darryl Strawberry, who helped them quite a bit. Well, they're the ones that really stepped up in that Baltimore series, you know? I mean, they were the ones that stepped up. And, and I, again, I'm not pointing fingers at anyone, but someone needs to step up and lead the way because they have a lot of guys on this ball club that have the potential to do that. But you have to want to do it. As I said, it's not something that's just going to automatically happen. Gordon's ahead of Knobloch, 0-2. Jeter is on deck. 1-0 Yanks in the third. Fouled off. Well, as Knobloch hit 265 this year, Todd Walker, his replacement at second base for the Twins, hit over 300. In the short term, then, Minnesota didn't miss him. In the long term, though, he's an all-star caliber player. Definitely. And it's taking him a year maybe to adjust. You can look for the real Chuck Knobloch to stand up next year for the Yankees. Foul back again. We mentioned Darryl Strawberry a moment ago. In the early to mid-80s, no team in baseball had two more highly regarded or two more charismatic young stars than the Mets with Dwight Gooden and Darryl Strawberry. Each had his moments. Each was a hero at times. Both seem destined for the Hall of Fame, and neither will make it, and you have to wonder what if. Good point, because I thought they were both going to make it together. Another foul ball. Well, there they are together. Strawberry, of course, on the left. Dwight Gooden. They're at the top of their game in New York. They weren't just good, they were so exciting to watch. The ballpark really stirred every time Darryl Strawberry came to the plate. And when Gooden took the mound, he didn't go for refreshments until the Mets came to bat. You wanted to see him work. Bob, to take that point, leader, one step farther. You know, if you were to pick the American League most valuable player this year, is probably not going to be from the Yankees, and they had the best team. So that tells you that there's not one guy who leads them. And in most great teams, you always have an MVP from that team. Knobloch strikes out swinging after a long at-bat. Gooden has now fanned three of the last four hitters he's faced. Baseball tomorrow. We'll open it up, 4 o'clock Eastern Time, Game 5 of this series. David Wells for the Yanks as scheduled. Now Chad O.J. for Cleveland instead of Garrett Wright. And Atlanta down 0-3 at San Diego, trying to stay alive on Fox at 7.30 Eastern Time. No team has ever recovered from an 0-3 deficit in any best-of-seven series in baseball history. LCS or World Series. to Jeter. Jeter will probably be the highest ranking Yankee in the MVP voting you were talking about, Joe. But he's likely to be behind Juan Gonzalez of Texas, perhaps Manny Ramirez of these Indians, and maybe even Nomar Garcia-Para of the Red Sox. 
They, yeah, you're right. I mean, so that points out that they are a team of stars, but not of superstars. Got the corner. One and two. They come to their feet at the Jake. Punch toward first. Tommy shovels to Gooden. Down go the Yankees in order in the third. Keith Alderman back at Jacobs Field, and Dwight Gooden may have injured himself, taking the throw from Jim Tomey at the end of the last inning. Watch as Gooden tags the bag. He seemed to be limping slightly. The left hip, Jim Gray suggests. And after that half inning, he and trainer Jim Warfield went behind the scenes here, back at the Indian dugout, to attend to whatever problem it is. We'll keep working it. Bob, up to you. Keith, thanks very much. For the moment, no action in the Cleveland bullpen. One and one to Enrique Wilson. Let's see, some people stirring now. We'll keep an eye on it, see if anybody gets up and throws in the Cleveland pen. A line drive that is snared by Martinez. And Wilson is out to start the Cleveland third. Well, he gets jammed a little bit. That's why Tino is able to run this ball down. Gets in on his hand a little bit. And Martinez with a nice play at first base. He almost broke his bat, but he hit the line drive. Martinez playing in perfectly because he was well off the line. Now back to the top for Kenny Lofton. Fouled out to third in the first inning. Leaving him just one for 16 in this series. Takes them all. Well, Luke has a variety of breaking balls. He throws that overhand curve to the left-hander, drops down and throws the sidearm breaking ball to the right-hander. Lofton hits it fair, inside the line, extra bases for him, chased down in right field by O'Neill, and a one-out double for Kenny. Well, Kenny Lofton has been hitting the ball well. He's been getting some good swings. He was actually fooled by that pitch, but he extended well and pulls it down the line. This is actually a good play by O'Neill because he hustles over there to get to the ball quickly because Kenny Lofton, in his speed, he might have tried for a triple. He sees out in front. And he hustles him into a double. Vizquel, who dumped a little flare in the left for a hit his first time up. Tries to drop a bunt, but it's foul. There's Dwight Gooden returning to the Indian dugout. No official report on what happened to him on that play where he covered first. In the top half of this inning, but no one is throwing in the Cleveland bullpen, and our best guess is that Gooden will be back out there for the fourth. Now, Luque wasn't happy that the scale tried to bunt there. He gave him a long stare as he came back into the batter's box. Check swing foul. So he's not supposed to bunt in a situation where a bunt might help in a one-run game in the playoffs? A lot of pitchers do not like you to bunt in certain situations. Pitchers have their own code. Duque is ahead 0-2. Time is called. No pitch. Well, you were telling me at dinner the other night about guys like Joey Jay when you first oh, yeah. came up. They instructed you as a rookie, don't step out of the box. He doesn't like that. Don't bunt on him. He doesn't like that. Larry Jackson knocked me down for that one day. I just stepped out of the batter's box. And he knocked me down and said, don't ever break my rhythm. <laughs> Protocol. Outside. And I said, yes, sir. In 
inside, two and two. In Washington pitch the left-handed hitters, he doesn't seem to have a definitive pattern, which is pretty good sometimes if you can throw strikes. He doesn't pitch each left-handed hitter the same. He will use his fastball on some, change up on the others, and he, he's thrown a, he started a lot of them off with curveball, the overhand curveball. A lot of times a pitcher has a pattern and he falls into it, and the hitters can see that from the bench and know exactly what to expect on certain pitches. But he doesn't seem to have a pattern against left-handed hitters. He does against right-handed. Drum guy goes back to work. And so does Hernandez, a liner that Jeter grabs and lost in his back. Two out, and it's up to Justice. This is a little breaking ball, a slider, not the curveball. That's a slider over the outside part of the plate. The scale just slaps at it and lines it. The shortstop, good base running by Kenny Lofton. He knew exactly where Derek Jeter was playing, and he got back quickly. Justice struck out in the first. Nobody there to cover. Scouting a report on David Justice as he lays off that changeup that got him out last time. You have to come inside to keep him honest. He'll chase some pitches up and out of the strike zone. He will chase some off the plate. We saw him do that against El Duque in the first inning. Chase that changeup away, down and away. Two balls and no strikes. Generally, Hernandez is very, very composed. This is a big situation for him, though, Bob. Your team's down 2-1, you're on the road. If you lose, they're down 3-1, which is very difficult to come back from. 2-0 pitch is in there. In fact, David Cohn said the most outward excitement that he's seen El Duque display was on his first day in a big league clubhouse. It blew him away. Cohn said from the gloves and the shoes, all piled up in the lockers, seemingly an unlimited supply to all the food on the buffet, the beautiful trainer's room, you could see that El Duque was amazed after all those years with the Cuban national team. Just off the inside corner, three and one. Hernandez, this Hernandez, not Levon, who was also pretty good, in Cuba, but this Hernandez was the best of his generation on the island. He says he loves to pitch in big games, partly because he figures Fidel Castro is watching. Three-one pitch, bounce back to the mound. El Duque has it, runs it halfway to the bag before flipping to Martinez, and they're out of the third. Still one nothing on the O'Neill home run. Gooden back to work. O'Neill, the man who hurt him with the home run in the first inning, leads off here in the fourth. You can see Dwight Gooden, 49 pitches, and Mike Hargrove is starting to get concerned when he gets around 90 pitches. They really start to watch him closely then. This is foul down the left field line. A ball and a strike. Everything Mike Hargrove did last night turned out right. Put Witten in the lineup, double and a homer. Put Enrique Wilson in the lineup, RBI hit. Outside, two and one. Only a few years ago, it was George Steinbrenner who took Dwight Gooden off the scrap heap and helped him to revitalize his dormant career. He had been out of baseball for a full year. It would be ironic if Gooden put Steinbrenner's team in a 3-1 hole tonight. 
Gooden had to sit out the whole season in 95 for violations of his aftercare program and Major League Baseball's drug policy. The boss gave him another chance and did the same for Darryl Strawberry. The 3-1, the count on which O'Neill homered, this time he takes a strike. Well, Gooden went after him differently this time. Last time he tried to throw a slider inside, he didn't get it in. This time he goes with the fastball, and he keeps it down. And he has hit Gooden well over his career. Here's the 3-2. And he draws a leadoff walk. Well, after throwing 49 pitches at the beginning of the inning, he threw a lot of extra pitches here. Fastball away. Another fastball away. There's the breaking ball inside. Good fastball there, and another fastball off the plate inside. You have to be careful with Paul O'Neill, not just because he had a home run in the first inning, but he has extra base power. He can lead off the innings with extra bases and put you right into trouble. Williams fouls the first one away. The walk to O'Neill was good in second. He struck out three. Bernie has seen two pitches. He grounded out on the first one, and he fouls this one away. And Dwight has thrown him two fastballs to start off each at bat. In this, his 10th postseason appearance, Mets, Yankees, now Indians, Gooden looking for his first postseason victory. There goes the runner. The throw from Alomar is not in time. O'Neill is a very sneaky base stealer. He swiped 15 in 16 attempts this year. Well, they're getting a good jump on Dwight Gooden especially in this particular play. See, a power pitcher always has to rock back and gather momentum, and when you do that, you give the runner a chance to get a great jump at first base, and O'Neill gets a good jump. It was actually a good throw this time from Alomar Jr., but not in time. There's Paul O'Neill slides in safely past this scale. And the 1-1 one -one to Williams, way high. So a walk on a 3-2 pitch, then a steal. Got a switch hitter up batting left-handed with a chance to just pull the ball to the right side and get the runner to third with only one out. And runs have been hard to come by for the Yankees. So Torrey's been starting some people trying to generate things tonight. Joe says he always likes to put runners in motion. He likes to hit and run. He likes to do those things, but he didn't have the opportunity last night because Cologne was so dominant. Williams couldn't stop. Two and two. Well, Torrey ran Chino Martinez earlier. And now Paul O'Neill steals a base. Willie Randolph, the coach at third. O'Neill, the runner at second. Williams, the hitter, with a 2-2 count. And it runs out full. Waits on deck. Ball four. Folks premiering next Saturday night. He's back. The man who can be anyone returns with something missing, his mind. What's your last name? It changes every week. The Pretender season premiere NBC next Saturday. The Pretenders, Saturday nights on NBC. Actually, the Pretender, singular, not plural. Wiley, the pitching coach to the mound. Well, he has walked two left-handed hitters here in the inning. I think he was trying to be a little too careful with 
Bernie Williams especially trying to keep him from pulling the ball to the right side. Davis will be the hitter. And the slumping Tino Martinez follows him. Torrey moved Davis up to five and dropped Martinez, the number five hitter all year, to the sixth slot tonight. Gooden has received some wily advice. At least he hopes. O'Neill at second, Williams at first, and Gooden works to Davis. A liner to left, down the line, Giles on the run. It lands fair and bounces up into the seats. O'Neill will score. Williams is racing behind and doesn't realize that he's going to be sent back to third base. On a ground rule double by Chili Davis, who goes the opposite way to give the Yankees a 2-0 lead, and they have runners at second and third, still nobody out. Well, Dwight starts Chili off with a high fastball, and Chili goes the other way. He's actually a little late on it, but he hits it in a good spot right down the left field line. Giles gave chase, but he could not get there. The ball bounces into the stands for a ground rule double. Giles playing over towards left center. No way for him to get there. And they got a break that the ball bounced into the seats because otherwise Williams would have scored. RBI spot for Martinez, who has had exactly four RBIs in his last 90 postseason at-bats. You still have to be careful with Tino even when he's in a slump because eventually he's going to break out. So you have to be careful. You have a base open. 2-0. Tino is hitless in this series. The infield is back, so he's in a spot where a ground ball or a fly ball will get one home. It's sharply in foul. That's exactly what you want to do if you are Pino Martinez as we take a look at Dave Berber warming up in the Indians bullpen. With runners at second and third and no one out, your job is to pull the ball. If you pull the ball to the right side, then Chili Davis will be able to move over to third while Bernie Williams scores and he will be able to score on a ground out or a fly ball. If you hit the flat ground ball to the left side, he'll have to hold and then you need a base hit to drive him in. So important that Tino Martinez pulls the ball in this situation. Time is called as Martinez steps out. There's 64 pitches, 90 is when they start to be concerned, but I think they should be concerned at 64 because he is really struggling with his control. 2-1 pitch is hit in the air to shallow right center field. Ramirez and Lofton. Lofton with the catch. Then he drops the ball. Williams heading home. And the ruling is safe. The ruling is that he did not have it long enough for a catch to be ruled. He's arguing that he dropped it as he tried to remove it from his glove and throw. And at least they should get credit for the out. I actually thought they should have let Ramirez catch the ball anyway. He has a better arm than Kenny Lofton. And that ball was shallow enough that he may have had a shot at Bernie Williams at the plate. But Hargrove is arguing that he was taking it out of his glove. Jim McKean is the ump at second base. This is at full speed now on this replay, so this is what the umpire saw. Well, that is a catch. But you have to control it. You have to be taking it out of your glove, so if you use the proper interpretation, see, he does have it. And he's trying to transfer it, but you have to be taking it out of your glove. See, he brought it from his right side towards his left, but you have to be taking it out of your glove. Hargrove has had his beef. I 
think it's a catch. Well, but, but the, the rules say, in theory, you can catch a ball one-handed like that, trot all the way to the infield and drop the ball, and it can be called ruled a no-catch because you're not taking the ball out of your glove. But he was in the process of transferring well, he brought it, it from glove to He hand. brought it from his right side to his left. They're saying that he wasn't transferring it. The Yankees now lead three to nothing. And the hitter is Posada. Davis held second. Martinez at first on the error. He gets credit for an RBI. They assume it would have been a sacrifice fly. Martinez at this point will take a ribby however he can get it. Two on and two in in the fourth. Two and oh. Posada out the first time Jorge back. Fouls it back. Posada is a converted infielder who's becoming a better catcher with each passing day, but Girardi is still the better receiver on the team. Posada has a dangerous bat, though. Here's the 2-1 pitch. Lofton with another chance in center field. Backpedaling a bit. Davis tags at second. Kenny with the catch. Davis to third. Martinez holds first. Runners at the corners with one out. out his last at bat he needs another strike out here infield looks for the double play and they may get it Vizquel to Wilson for one guns it across and Toby scoops it out and they're out of the inning minimizing the damage, but they still trail 3-0. In nineteen ninety-eight, the Goodyear Blimp Spirit of Akron is proud to be part of the one hundredth anniversary celebration of the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company. And we thank them for the overhead shots of a beautiful Jacobs Field, which is really the centerpiece of downtown Cleveland these days. The Gund Arena where Mike Fratello's Cleveland Cavaliers play is right next door called strike from Hernandez to Ramirez as we move to the bottom of the fourth. And Hernandez seems to be settling in. He's probably over his rustiness from not pitching for 15 days. As Joe Torre said, he's worried about the first couple of innings. Well, he's progressed past that. He seems to be settling in pretty well. Torre's Yanks got two runs on just one hit, the opposite field double by Chili Davis in the fourth. A couple of walks and an error contributed to the two-run scoring. Good fastball right there. When a guy drops down and throws sidearm, it takes you a while to pick the ball up. When he spots it away from you like that, it's very difficult to hit. You have a better chance of hitting that breaking ball out there because you have more time. You don't have any time on this fastball. You don't have time to find it right there. Boom. Still one and two. We talked about Joe Torrey's pass list. 32 of them here in Cleveland. Manny Ramirez has to hand out many freebies when this series goes back to the Bronx, if it does go back to the Bronx. He's from the Washington Heights area of New York. Lots of friends come to see him play. He goes down swinging. 
He has been more effective with the fastball against Ramirez than he has the breaking ball. He starts him with a breaking ball on the corner, but then he misses, and another fastball right out there on the edge. Back inside with another fastball, and he finishes him off with a fastball in. Third strikeout for Hernandez. Tommy fly to deep right his first time up. There were two men on at the bottom of the first, and he came very close to driving one out of here. Sent O'Neill to within a step or two of the wall and right. One and one. I'll tell you what, he's reaching back, getting a little extra on the fastball now. He's up to 92 miles an hour. That's a pretty good fastball. I love to watch him work. He's a high socks wearing, high kicking, <laughs> side arming guy. <laughs> yeah, he's just bringing it now. He's reaching back, saying, "Well, let's see if you can hit my fastball." So here's another fastball. This is 91 miles an hour, but he's just reaching back and saying, "I'm going to let it go until somebody shows me they can hit it." Is one two to Tommy. Is low. Change up. Take a look at this motion. This is the side from the first base side. Look how high he gets his left knee up to his shoulder. That helps him hide the baseball from the hitter. Hernandez, as Keith Oberman told us on the pregame show was banned from Cuban baseball, where he was a great star, for two years. They suspected he would defect, especially after his brother LeVon did. And down goes Tommy, two straight strikeouts to start the fourth, and four in the game for El Duque. Well, his fastball is doing the damage in this inning here. Fastball in, fastball four strikes. Another fastball, he swings through it, throws him a change up away. Now he comes back with another fastball in under the hand. Just beautiful pitching there from Hernandez. Ultimately, Cuban authorities were right. They suspected El Duque would defect, and he did. He was offered a U.S. visa, and at first declined it for business reasons. Established residency in Costa Rica, that way he could become a free agent rather than be subject to the baseball draft. And knowing his value, he was able to get a big contract right away from the Yankees. But he's paying off because they do not have to spend a lot of money to develop it in the minor league. He spent a little time down there, and now he's here pitching in the fourth game of the league championship series. Inside, 3-0. He got his chance to make his way into the starting rotation in early June after David Cohn missed a start when his mother's Jack Russell Terrier bit him on the index finger. The Yankees are actually thankful that the Bowser took a nip out of Cohn, only cost him one start. They got a look at El Duque. He went 12 and 4. Here's the 3 1. Fouled off. Now we're thinking ahead here, Joe. But considering Pettit's problems, if the Yankees get a comfortable lead in this game, do you get Hernandez out of there maybe after six or seven innings on the possibility that you want him well-rested in case you want to bring him back as your game seven starter if it goes that far? Well, I mean, that's a possibility, but Joe Torre says he's going to stick with Andy Pettit. A mile-high pop back of the plate. Posada has it. Yeah, he says he'll stick with Bennett. He also told Jim Gray everything is subject to change. No change in the score. Story about whether he would pitch game seven or not. He is a big game pitcher. He's pitched in big games before. The biggest game on the island is when his team would play against Ray Ordonez's team of the Mets. And you're, as you mentioned, Castro, everybody would turn out. And he said that was the biggest game. And he said this kind of reminds him of that type of a game. So he knows how to pitch under pressure. On to the Yankee fifth. And Gooden gets ahead of Brocious 0-2. 
and that's unusual. He has been behind so many hitters. He walked a couple of hitters last in, and that has been his downfall. And the Yankees have been very good at making him work. I mean, they've made him, they've made him go deep into the count, and basically he's walked the hitters and gotten himself into trouble. There is three bases on balls. I mean, that's where his problems have started. They have not really hit him that hard, but he's helped them out a lot. Well, in fact, the Yankees have only two hits. And one, the one by Chili Davis, was kind of an off-field jam job. The other was a homer to right by O'Neill. Three runs on two hits. One and two. The Indians also have two hits. A bloop single by Vizquel and a double from Lofton. This is nice 0-2 pitch. Kind of a wake-up call. 0-2, fastball up and in. Don't lean out there on the curveball. Right field. Back from first is Tommy. Over from right is Ramirez, and nobody has a play. Rochus obtained from Oakland in the deal that sent the left-hander Kenny Rogers to the A's. Raised his average almost 100 points. Hit a dismal 203 for the A's and an even 300 in New York. And it was interesting because he said that the, one of the problems was last year he hit from a, such an open stance that it was causing a lot of problems trying to adjust to that. This year he went back to a square stance and he hit 300. With 90, 98 RBIs, to me, that's the most important statistic there, not the 300. Two balls and two strikes. You can see he's hitting from that square stance now, whereas he was open facing the pitcher a lot last year and really struggled. More conventional stance there. A breaking ball hit into left field for a leadoff hit. Rocious is one for two. The Yankees' third hit off Doc Gooden. Well, this is the pitch that he wanted to get him out with. That's why he threw the 0-2 fastball in to keep him from reaching out there to get this breaking ball. But it's a slider that's pretty much in the middle of the plate. A lot of times when you hit from an open stance, you have much more movement than there. You can that you can see that he pretty compact swing right there. From an open stance, you have to first close your stance and then stride to the pitcher. So that's a lot more movement than a lot of hitting coaches like to see you have. Now blocks 0 for 2. Jeter on deck. Shows bunt and takes inside. Grove has Burba the right-hander and Poole the left-hander getting ready. Dwight Gooden is 33 years old, but as Jay Greenberg of the New York Post put it recently, he has to be one of the oldest 33-year-olds on the planet. He came up to the big leagues at age 19. He knew stardom. He knew dismal failure, actually personal humiliation. He's come back. It's been a long trail for him. Climbing in close at third. Knobloch looks to bunt again and can't get it done. Well, anytime you see a hitter square to bunt, that high fastball is the toughest pitch to bunt, and a lot of times you can get him to pop it up. If you see a hitter square around, try to throw the fastball up. Gooden throws this one up, and it's just difficult to get that ball bunted on the ground. Another example of the various nicks and bruises that come with the catcher's position. That one bounced up and took a bite out of Sandy. Bob, you talk about all the problems that Dwight Gooden has had. You know, he's one of the nicest guys you ever want to meet. He just made some bad decisions. But he's always been a nice person. His teammates have always loved him. Close his back. Even though the Yankees lead 3-0, Torrey is under no illusions. They're not exactly busting out with the bats, so he's prepared to start runners. He's prepared to bunt in a situation like this. Anything to generate runs. I've always felt it was the manager's job to help the offense when it goes stale by putting runners in motion, which helps the hitters concentrate, makes them concentrate on putting the ball in play more often. And you can bunt, you can hit and run, you can have them take a few pitches. So I've always felt that that's his job. When he sees that they're not hitting, help them out as much as possible.
bunt pitch out. Roche just wasn't going anywhere. Yeah, but now you put yourself in that perfect hit and run situation by pitching out. 2 1, 3 1, 1 0. Oh, those are perfect hit and run situations. So a chess game in the dugouts in which Torrey has gained a small edge right now. Well, I think he, you're right. I think he has the edge if he wants to send Brocious. He goes. And Knobloch is jammed and pops it up. Brocious comes back. And Tommy makes the catch. Tomorrow at 2 Eastern time, watch the final round of the Michelob Championship at Kings Mill from Williamsburg, Virginia. Currently, David Duval is in the lead at 12 under par, a stroke ahead of the field. That's the final round of the Michelob Championship at Kings Mill tomorrow at 2 Eastern on NBC. Well, Torrey got what he wanted, but Knobloch actually tried to hit the ball to right field, and he got jammed. On, Jeter looking for his first hit of the night. Derek Jeter is a good hitter that basically tries to go to right field. He's improved every year with the experience that he's gained from playing here in New York. And he takes the outside pitches to right field. You have to pitch him inside. And Cleveland has done a good job of pitching him up and in, which is a tough pitch for a right-hander to handle when, you, when it's thrown by a right-handed hit pitcher. There it is again. That's exactly where they want to pitch him. to the count to Derek. All-star and matinee idol in New York. Popping up all over the place on magazine covers, including GQ during the season. One of the city's more eligible bachelors. Well, now Gooden has him in a good situation. If he can get a sinker down and out over the plate, he may be able to get the ground ball to get out of the inning. Sliced foul, still 0-2. When you look at Jeter and what he does at the plate and how smooth he is in the field, hard to imagine how green he must have been in A ball at Greensboro in 1993 when he made 56 errors at shortstop in A ball. Bob, some of those infields in A ball are very difficult to play. Bad hops everywhere. So I'll use that as an excuse for it. <laughs> Man. That doesn't explain 56 errors playing in a salt mine. <laughs> the 0-2 pitch. Another foul. Well, you can see Gooden established that he, won he came inside twice to get ahead in the count, and he tried to go away the last two pitches to finish him off. Hargrove knows that he has the advantage now, but if the Yankees win this one, and they have Wells and Cone set to pitch games five and six. And then potentially two out of three in their ballpark if it goes seven. The slight edge goes back the Yankees' way. Jammed him and he fights it off. Good job by Jeter here. I mean, he is fighting everything off, not trying to do too much with it, not over swinging. He's cut down on his swing. The two fastballs away fought off. Now this one back inside again, and he just fights it off again. Good pitches there by Good. You can see he's just fighting them off, not having a good swing at him, but that's his job. Fight him off until he makes a mistake. Again, the 0-2 pitch, but first, Brocious is chased back. up on 90. Wiley and Hargrove had hoped 
but he could give them six innings. We're in the fifth. One on, one out. And a one-two pitch coming. Another foul ball. Well, Jeter just hanging tough here. That was a breaking ball away. He just reaches out and pokes it foul. He's tried fastballs in, fastballs away. He throws a breaking ball away, and, and Jeter just fights it off. Watch this. Not a swing that he could hurt you with, but he just spoiled that good pitch there by Gooden. Just with his lead at first. And Jeter steps out. the thought in the Indians head no doubt about that that just about anybody in this order not just the speedsters just about anybody could be running in a given situation Gross has stole 11 this year in 19 attempts so he's not a great base stealer and Jeter again hangs in well Gooden finally tried something different that was kind of a sinking fastball He's throwing him a variety of pitches. This one is kind of a sinking fastball. See how he turns it over. He gets some sink on it. And J Jeter hits the top of it. Actually a good pitch to try. You see the ball moving down, but Jeter gets the top of it. on the mound through 16 complete games in his Cy Young season half of them shutouts now as a 33 year old veteran a different kind of pitcher hoping to give his team six seven good innings and turn it over to the bullpen but trailing here three nothing as he struggles in the fifth outside and low two and two He's at 90 pitches, but I'm sure Grover has been concerned since about 64. What an at bat for Derek Jeter. I mean, just he spoils all the good pitches that Jeter has made. I mean, that Gooden has made here. And Gooden has not made a mistake, though. You fight him off till you get one that you can handle, but he continues to make good pitches. I mean, look at this. I mean, if you can make a hitter swing like this, you know he's not going to be able to drive the ball. But the guys on the bench say, hang tough, and he's doing that. continues and the 2-2 pitch is bounced to short the scale to Wilson for one on the first safe good hustle by Jeter he got out of the box he was tied up because the ball was inside and he couldn't get out of the box very quickly but he really hustled down the line to keep this from being a double play you can watch the scale flips it to Wilson and he fires the first but Jeter hustles it out for fielder's choice. Now Poole is throwing in the bullpen as we take one more look along with Burba. Poole is the left-hander. O'Neill, who homered earlier off Gooden is the next hitter. And as you might expect then, that does it for Doc Gooden. He leaves on the short end of a 3-0 score. And we're back to the Jake after this. Doctor is out. Mike Hargrove thanks him for his effort. 
So now Dwight Gooden has appeared in 10 postseason games over his career and still hasn't won one. Can only lose tonight. Trailing 3 nothing, so his postseason record could fall to 0-4 unless the Indians rally. Jim Poole comes in. He was with the Indians when they went to the World Series in 1995. In fact, he threw the pitch that his now teammate David Justice hit for the Braves for the game-winning home run in Game 6 in Atlanta. Most recently, he had been with the Giants. When they cut him loose, the Indians took him back, and with the help of their minor league pitching coach Bud Black and their big league pitching coach Mark Wiley, he rediscovered his curveball and has become pretty effective again. Brought in to face O'Neill. Ball struck. Jeter gets back easily. The situation where if Paul O'Neill was to fall behind the count 0-2 or 1-2. You may see Jeter take off from first base, try to steal a base. Who works to the plate. A ball and a strike. O'Neill has homered and walked. Tailing down and away, one and two. Good sharp breaking ball there from Poole. This is his out pitch to left-handed hitters. Good hard breaking ball. That's more of a slider than a curve ball. And O'Neill can't catch up with it. Here's the one-two, the first. They pay a bit more attention to Derek Jeter. Paul O'Neill, one of the very few big leaguers that still uses a big bat. He uses a 35-inch, 35-ounce bat. Most big league hitters now use 34 and a half, 32, 31 ounces. Now the one-two. Two and two. You were famous for using a very tiny glove at second base. What about your bat? No, I use a standard bat, 34 and a half inch, 32, and sometimes 33 ounces. Jeter's not going, and O'Neill taps it weakly foul. I think that pitch right there is the reason that a lot of hitters use a lighter bat, that slider, because you, on, the, on the fastball, you have to be quick. On the curveball, you have to wait. And on the slider, you have to wait and be quick. And that's what he tries to do here, wait and then be quick. And that's very difficult to do. So a lighter bat helps a lot of hitters to do that. But O'Neill still feels that he can swing the 35-ounce bat, which he does very well. at two and two and you can see Paul O'Neill very upset with himself because he had no chance of hitting that ball he actually swung in self-defense this is kind of watch this a self-defense when this pitch is up and in instead of getting out of the way he fights it off of him see right there yeah, yeah that's a self-defense swing right there another 2-2 two -two pitch Jeter runs this time here's the throw for Alamo it bounces away, and Jeter pops up. It hit the umpire, I believe. He had the base stolen. I think it hit Jim McKean, the umpire, and kicked away. And if so, Alomar is going to pick up an error he really doesn't deserve. Well, I think you're right. It did hit Jim McKean. 
Well, after you get behind in the count, it's the wise move to go ahead and send him because even if he's thrown out, Paul O'Neill starts off the next inning for you. But you see, Jim tries to skip it. The ball hits the ground, and then it hits him on his left foot and bounces away. Watch this throw. It's going to hit the ground first. You see Jim trying to decide which way to go. No, it hit him in the air. He was trying to decide which way to go. It wasn't near the bag. Not a good throw from Alomar Jr. But O'Neill strikes out on the 3-2 pitch. The error in stolen base don't hurt the Indians. Still 3-0 New York. Back in Cleveland, as you take a look at this young man, a bat boy tonight, his name is James DeAngelo. Well, he was in the hotel this morning, saw George Steinbrenner walking around the hotel, went up and introduced himself to George, said he was at a game two and a half years ago and got hit by a foul pitch, suffered some minor injuries. The young man was told by Mr. Steinbrenner, I'm going to get you a uniform. You're going to be a bat boy tonight. So his dad is here in the stands, and James is a very fortunate young man. Bob? Jim, thanks a lot. Nice story. George Steinbrenner, of course, is from Cleveland. Family shipbuilding business here. Well, George has done a lot of good things that people do not hear about often. I always remember the story Tony Foss has told me that he wouldn't have been able to go to college without George Steinbrenner's help. Hernandez works to Giles, and the 2-1 pitch is fouled back. For Clevelander Steinbrenner, the playoff trail ended here for the Yanks a year ago when they dropped game five of the division series at the Jake. Hoping that it's not the Indians from his old hometown that deals him disappointment again this season. It would be especially bitter this time around because of all the expectations brought on by a 114 and 48 regular season. A lot of people pointed toward a Yankee Brave World Series. Atlanta's part of it looks especially shaky. Down 0-3 to the Padres. The Yankees might be about to draw even tonight with the Indians. Full count to Giles. Leading off of the Cleveland fifth. With the Indians trailing 3-0. His fastball has been the most effective of pitch the last two innings. He hasn't thrown as many to Giles as I thought he would. There's another one. Foul back toward us. Still a full count. Giles fly to center. His only trip to the plate. He'll be followed by Alomar and Wilson in the fifth. You can have all the different motions you want, but if you do not have a good enough fastball to keep the hitters honest, they will wait on some of that motion and pick up the ball after you release it. They can wait a little longer. A little pop into shallow right. O'Neill comes racing in. Back goes Knobloch from second and ranging way out there. It's Chuck who makes the catch. As you know, game five of this series is tomorrow. It's an afternoon game, late afternoon of the day, 4 Eastern time. David Wells will be the Yankee starter. And Mike Hargrove turns away from Jarrett Wright and to Chad OJ, who won two games in the World Series last year for the Indians and pitched five and a third strong innings of relief in game one of this series after Wright was knocked out in the first at Yankee Stadium. Sandy Alomar swings on the first pitch. And Jeter will handle it. So Sandy's had a tough night. Strike out, pop out. And he's been charged with two errors behind the plate. He only deserved one of them. Each came on throws. The second one was a fluke when it hit the umpire. has retired seven in a row trying to get Wilson to close out the fifth in order ball one
Mike Hargrove tells us that Enrique Wilson's best position is shortstop. But with Omar Vizquel around, no one's going to play here but Omar at shortstop. So they have him at second base for the time being. They're going to pursue a good hitting second baseman, someone with some pop in the offseason. Brosius with a nice play. And he throws him out. In fact, Roberto Alomar's name is frequently mentioned. But if they don't land the guy they want, Enrique Wilson could be the starting second baseman next year in Cleveland. Still 3 nothing Yanks. Not too much traffic on the streets outside the Jake. Everybody in Cleveland, either in the ballpark, it seems, or at home, listening to the game on the radio, or watching us. When the Indians play in the playoffs, that's pretty much the center of attention in this town. Burba comes in, as expected, Jim Poole. Faced just one batter, it was Paul O'Neill, who struck him out. And they also have a new catcher in there. Anar Diaz comes in. So Sandy Alomar, who's been bothered by a creaky knee, I guess was taken out for that reason. On his last swing, when he went back to the dugout, he disappeared, you know, and like he was saying, I just can't swing, I just can't do it. And, I mean, he's really struggled to swing the bat. He really had a look of resignation on his face, and he is a tough player, so it takes a lot to bring him to that point. And he's played a long time with the injured knee. He'll have surgery on it as soon as the Indian season ends. So a new battery for Cleveland. Burba and Diaz. Two out of Williams is a called strike. In his career, Dave Burba is 0-3 against the Yankees with an ERA upwards of six. As recently as September 22nd, the Yankees teed off on him for four home runs. He's been effective in this postseason, though, out of Cleveland's bullpen. Three and one. Burba, the former Red, and start or relieve. Lead off walk. And next Saturday night on NBC. On the Profiler. Profiler a week from tonight on NBC. different Yankee ball club tonight. They're taking a lot of pitches, allowing the Indians to walk them. And they're always getting into hitters count as compared to last night when Cologne was throwing spikes and getting ahead of the hitters. Williams at first with his second walk of the night. Davis, the hitter, is one for two. An RBI double in the fourth. Fastball for a strike, going two. Good fastball right on the inside corner from Berber. The little lineup change that Torrey made paid off when he moved Davis into the fifth slot when Martinez got to bat in that inning. All he needed was a fly ball to get a run home, and he managed that. If you're the Yankees, you say, we know he's going to break out of it. Just hope that he can do it either today or tomorrow so he can have some confidence going into the latter stages of the series. Struck him out, runner going, and Williams is safe. Not a bad throw for Diaz just into the game. Well, it was a very difficult pitch to throw, and he looked like a change-up down. He came up and he fired to second base, but Williams had a good jump. This is clearly a hit and run. As Chile had two strikes on him, and Williams takes off. You see him look at the plate. I'm trying to figure out why Vizquel caught the ball as he did. Well, he fell down. He overran the base. He ran too far to the short uh, first base side. Look where he is. So he has to reach back and he tries to make the tag and Bernie's in safely. Martinez. 
if he's going to bust out of it here, he's facing a guy against whom he has a good history. He's five for nine with a home run in his career against Burba. One zero pitch. Two and zero to Tino Martinez with Jorge Posada on deck. to hit way high and outside three and one when you struggle a little bit you lose usually try to say I'm going to hit the ball middle of the plate out or middle of the plate in you try to find a zone that you think you can handle but he seems to be swinging a lot of pitches in and misses pitches away he's just not making good contact One pitch is fouled off. Martinez's demeanor is generally so calm, he's outwardly placid, it's sometimes difficult to read how something is affecting him. He doesn't betray the fact that he may be pressing. You can't see it outwardly, but he has to be at least a little bit. Well, he showed a lot of class in this entire series for taking the blame for game two. game two loss I mean he said if he makes a better throw there's not a problem so I mean he accepts the responsibility that it that goes with hitting in the Yankee lineup and being the RBI man but he just seems to be late on the fastball that's that's what I'm noticing here he had a 3-1 fastball he fouled it over the Cleveland dugout 3-2 fastball he's late on And he pops it up, Tommy into foul ground. Martinez still struggles. Well, if you're late on the fastball and early on the curve, that's where your problems are. I mean, you, it takes a breaking ball up, fastball down, strike on the fastball, 2-0 and fastball. Now watch this 3-1 and fastball right down the middle of the plate, and he hits it over the Indians' dugout. On the inner half, he hits it over the dugout. Then he throws him an off-speed breaking ball. He's out in front of it. That means your timing is way off. You're late on the fastball and early on the breaking ball. Well, that belies what I was saying a moment ago. There's some emotion. And some X-rated commentary, which is very rare for Martinez. Well, Joe Torre may like that. At least, you know, he may. Sometimes it takes you to get mad and say, I'm just tired of this and I'm going to do something about it. Take my word for you. You do get mad. <laughs> well, he showed it there. For the first time that we've seen in this postseason, despite the fact that he's been struggling from the outset. It's to the point now where it has to be growing in his mind. Season after season, he puts up huge numbers for 162 games, and then it all deserts him. It isn't a matter of degree. The bottom just falls out on him in the postseason. It's not a tail off. He just bottoms out. Williams at second with two out now. He walked and stole a base. Two and one the count to Posada. Let's go to Jim Gray. Well, Bob, much of what he said, I can't repeat, but one of the comments he said was, what are you looking at out there? 
talking to himself. In other words, he may not be seeing the ball well or he's just not picking it up. Uh, Thanks, Jim. The lip readers in the audience pretty much know what he said. Posada fans, the ball rolls away. Diaz throws the first to the tyrant. To the bottom of the sixth, 3-0 New York. Friday telecast is presented by authority of the Commissioner of Baseball and may not be retransmitted in any form, and the accounts and descriptions of this game may not be disseminated without express written consent. 3-0 New York in the bottom of the sixth, but it seems like the Yankees have just left a ton of base runners, but... Really, they've only left four base runners, and Cleveland has left three, Bob. And it's the top of the order for Cleveland in the bottom of the sixth. Off-speed pitch taken by Lofton for a ball. But the one thing, you, looking at this game, just the way it's progressing, you can't be really comfortable if you're in New York. Even though El Duque is throwing well, three runs is not a lot of runs against this Cleveland ball club. And when you leave that, you leave runners and you have opportunities, you do not take advantage of them. It usually catches up with you somewhere along the way. Two and one the count. Brocious is in close at third. Joe Torre told us in thinking about the 15-day layoff for Orlando Hernandez, if it was going to bother him, it would probably be in the early innings. He thought if he could settle in early, then he'd find his groove. That may have happened. This ball has popped up. Has it for the first out of the sixth. Perhaps the most important pitch thrown in this game by El Duque was the one that Jim Tomey didn't quite get all of in the first inning. He was struggling as Torrey feared he might in the first inning. Two on, two out, and Tomey nearly hit it out for a three run home run. Just barely missed it. O'Neill took it on the warning track. Hernandez weathered that storm and has the Indians shut out to this point on two hits. A strike to Vizquel. And he seems to like to really like to start a lot of left-handed hitters off with the overhand curveball. Oh and two. Still throwing well. He's lost about three miles an hour off this fastball. See that tuck, and then he hides the pitch, moves away from the left-handed hitter. Fastball up high. The scale has singled, stolen a base, and lined to short. is a base hit. Just the third for Cleveland. Well, he knows he got the pitch up too high. He starts him off with a curve, curve ball for a strike. Fouls off the fastball. Takes the fastball. Now he hits this one toward the end of the bat, but he flips it in the left center field for a base hit. Duque pointed to himself and said it was his fault simply because he didn't get the pitch down. Up steps Justice. Hudson misses at the first one. Omar Vizquel, two for three tonight. Hit 500 against the Yankees in last year's division series. And is now at 438 on 7 for 16 in this series. Well, he's had Justice's number with that changeup. And so far, he's handling pretty well. But if you make one mistake, Justice can make him pay for it. Oh, he hit him. Unintentional, obviously. Justice trying to shake it off as he heads toward first. But he threw him a change up away, he swung and missed, and he just wanted to throw the fastball inside to show him a fastball because I think he was going to try to get him out with a change up again. But this pitch gets away, it's inside, and Justice can't get out of the way. Fastball in. And 
Justice just cannot get out of the way. Fastball just supposed to be inside. Gets him on the right elbow. And that really hurts. And it gets you on the elbow because that bone there and there's nothing else. This fastball gets away from him. Justice keeps his elbow in, and it just gets him on the elbow. He couldn't raise his arm. Get them out of the way. Their assistant trainer, Jim Warfield, came out, took a look at him. It's smart, but he'll stay in. And suddenly, on a single and a hit batter, the tying run comes to the plate in the person of Manny Ramirez. And you have Jim Tomey to follow, so their powers here with a chance to tie. Ball one. Well, he got Ramirez out with a fastball. The last time he threw him a breaking ball to start and then threw fastballs in under the hands. Six at bats this year against Hernandez. Ramirez is hit this. The 1 0. Outside. Well, Stottlemyre knows that El Duque is a pitch or two away from big trouble. Well, that shows you what he's thinking right there. He goes away with both pitches where he's been successful with the fastball under the hands. He doesn't want to go in there and make a mistake and leave that ball over the inside part of the plate because he knows Ramirez has power in that area. The 2-0 pitch is fouled out of play. And that's a good pitch. That fastball inside, he didn't leave it out over the plate. Two balls and no strikes. Ramirez looking for a fastball. He gets it, but it's in just enough that he can't extend to get to where he wants. It's a hair late on it. Hudson misses two and two. Ramirez with four homers in this postseason. Homer and a long double last night. Well, he chases the fastball away. This ball looked like it really sailed. It took off on him. It's supposed to be inside, but look where it is. It's away, and it kind of sailed on him, and he could not reach it. Jeff Nelson, the righty. Sam Lloyd, the lefty. In Joe Torre's full time. and a jam in the sixth. Two on, one out. And Ramirez steps out. Doesn't get any easier. Tommy next. him out. Huge strikeout for El Duque. Well, his fastball has been very effective against Ramirez. Each time he struck him out, it's been with a fastball. This is not inside, but it's just a good fastball. He drops down and throws the fastball by Ramirez. And Ramirez, you watch, he'll be late on it. So you can see that ball right past him. And smart pitching there by El Duque because he had been pitching him inside and he didn't want to go back in there and then make a mistake, so he fired him up with fastballs away. Five strikeouts for Hernandez now. He 
he's walked one and hit a man. The hit batter was Justice in this inning. He's at first, Vizquel is at second. Tommy has flied the deep right and struck out. Ball one. Well, after his injury, everything kind of slowed down, which is to be expected. You lose your timing, but he feels like he's swinging the bat well again. Foul back. The injury was a broken hand, hit on the hand by a Wilson Alvarez pitch. This is what he's done tonight. Almost jacked this one out of here on El Duque in the first, but O'Neill took it on the warning track, and then Hernandez struck him out in the fourth. And just nice fastball there in that last at bat, right in under the hands. That one makes the seats, and it's one and two. Same spot. He struck him out on that pitch last time. Tommy gets a piece of this one. I mean, it's an identical pitch to the one he struck him out on in his last at bat. Right in under the hands, but Tommy fouls it back. You see Posada move in right there. Perfect pitch off the plate just enough that if he does get out in front of him, he's going to pull it foul. They fell asleep, and Vizquel takes third. Well, we saw this earlier that Rochas was playing back so far that there's no way that he could get to third base before Vizquel, even if he tried a regular steal. You see right there, smart play by Rochas to say, hey, hold it. Don't throw the ball. Not only deep, but so far off the bag with the full hitting Tommy up. Actually, Tommy has great power to left center, but they don't figure him to hit the ball down the line, so Rochas at third base is way off the bag and deep, and Vizquel, seeing that, just strolled to third. Much as anything, Stottlemyre wants to make sure that Hernandez's focus isn't broken by that. And he also wants to make sure that he doesn't balk because the scale has tried this quite a few times in this series where he makes breaks toward the plate trying to get the pitcher to balk. Now Torrey trying to get Martinez's attention. Let's see where Tino plays. Vizquel is the runner at third. Justice at first. Let's see if he moves in to hold it. Tino backpedaling into position. The pitch to Tomi down and away. Two and two. comes home. They check at third base, and no, he did not go around, says Jim Evans, so the count is full. Well, this will be off from first. They've been trying to get him out inside. We talked about the fastball under the hands. This one, again, is in under the hands, and Tommy able to lay off. Climbing is on deck. Justice goes on the 3-2 pitch. But first, El Duque steps off. back 
That was Hernandez's 100th pitch. Hernandez must be a little more effective at hiding the baseball than it appears because that's a fastball in. I mean, it was a pretty good pitch for Tommy to handle, and he's late on it. He had trouble with his fastball the entire night. Struck him out. Well, how does he react in a jam? He strikes out Ramirez and Tommy to preserve the three-nothing lead. On to the seventh. Hits are even. Score is not. Three nothing New York. Chad Curtis starting tonight in left field is struck out and hit into a double play. Will be followed by Brocious and Knobloch. The plate umpire Larry Young holding up play for a moment, and I'm not exactly sure why. Well, there was a light over a couple of boots from us. It was not us. A ball to Curtis. Dave Burba on the mound now for Cleveland has been very important for the Indians this year. He gave them some important innings so they didn't have to place too much pressure on some of their younger pitchers during the course of the season. And in game two of the division series against the Red Sox, when Gooden was tossed, as was Hargrove in the first inning, Burba came on to give them a long stretch out of the bullpen, keep them in the game. They rallied, came back, and won even the series, then won the next two at Fenway. The report on Sandy Alomar is that he left the game because of back spasms, and his availability is day-to-day. -day. So his leaving this game didn't have anything to do with his aching knee that has bothered him all season, at least according to that report. Three and one to Curtis. says that the balls are he just sees the ball really moving well from some of these top pitchers and I still believe that the top 25 pitchers in baseball are still very very good even with expansion and that's basically you're seeing the top pitchers in the playoffs this year because I'm, I'm still surprised right there Chad Curtis had a 3-1 fastball and he's late on it this gal naturally throws him out Let's go back to the conclusion of the Indian sixth. First Hernandez struck out Ramirez. Now he puts Tomey away to end the inning and the threat. Well, he'd thrown him fastballs and Tomey was late on him and then he came back with a changeup. That was a beautiful changeup. And the bench all excited because that was a great pitch. Here's Brocious who's one for two. Check swing foul. tonight. He has the Indians shut out. Brocious gives one a ride to left, but it's foul. It's doubtful that Hernandez will be around at the finish tonight. He was used to going all the way in Cuba, though. In fact, Joe Torre says the first time he had to take Hernandez out of a game, I practically had to pry his glove open and take the ball out myself. Joe said when he had been told he was going to be the fourth pitcher, to, you know, fourth game pitcher, 
of the series with Texas, and it didn't go that far. He didn't get a chance to pitch. He thought automatically that meant that he would start this series against Cleveland. And Joe had to explain to him that, no, that doesn't work that way. This is the fourth game, but you're not our fourth game, our first game pitcher. So he now gets his start here in the fourth game of this series. He has an aces mentality. And after all, he wasn't just the ace. He was the top pitcher in the whole country. He was the ace of the Cuban national team. Brocious is a strikeout victim. Baseball doubleheader tomorrow. We'll start it off at 4 Eastern time from the Jake. Wells against OJ in game five of this series. Then Atlanta tries to stay alive at San Diego. What an atmosphere there. Those folks were going wild as the Padres took a 3-0 lead in that series against Atlanta earlier today. Now Knobloch, who's 0 for 3. Can you imagine the San Diego Padres? They beat both Maddox and Glavin now. They beat Randy Johnson twice. And won a game that John Smoltz started. Boomer Wells offered to pitch today in game four on three days rest with the Yankees down 2-1. There he is with Andy Pettit, last night's loser. And at least at the moment, the seventh game starter, if it goes that far. Charging is Wilson. And he throws Knobloch out. Torrey told Wells, no, no. You're scheduled to pitch the fifth game. Just sit tight until then. Yanks lead it, 3-0. The spirit of Akron is based in Suffield, Ohio, just 50 miles south of Jacobs Field on the tradition of 70 years of Goodyear blimps hovering over major events in America. Travis Fryman starts it in the Cleveland 7. A lot of the talk before the ball game was about El Duque's breaking ball, but his fastball has been his most effective pitch. He's mixed in a few change-ups, but it's been his fastball that he's used to set these hitters up with. been able to spot the fastball well in under the hands of the left-handed hitter in under the hands of some of the right-handed hitters. Here's his 1-1 to Travis Fryman. Sidearm lined, a one-hopper taken by Jeter, who throws him out. Let's go back to the conclusion of the Yankees' seventh. Here's the pitch from Berber that gets in on Knobloch's hands. He's retired at first, and as he crosses the bag, he talks it over with his coach, Jose Cardinal. Inside? Your kitchen. I know, but did I let it get on me, or was it inside? Oh, boy, you look like a cutter. No, you play, dude. You play defense now. <laughs> <laughs> now Giles pops one up. Posada's got it. Well, what he said there, he said he got in your kitchen. That's what Cardinal said. Your kitchen is that handle. When they get in tight on you and break your bat or hit you on the handle, that's your kitchen. And just right there, El Duque got in Brian Giles' kitchen. Watch this fastball in on the hands, and he's late on it. As I said, his fastball has been his best pitch tonight. And watch this. Late on it, on the handle, pops it foul over by the Indians' dugout. Right in on the hands. And Posada makes the play. Now the first at-bat of the night for Einar Diaz, who replaced Sandy Alomar, who had to come out with back spasms. is 25 years old, kind of on the small side for a catcher these days, 5'10 and 165. Played a handful of games for the Indians 
in 96 and 97, most of that time in the minors. That's here with two out and nobody on in the seventh. That's a strike, two and one. Hernandez faced the Indians twice during the regular season. Both times here, a no decision and a loss. Fouled out of play in the loss, which came on July 13, Lofton and Tommy homered against him. In the no decision, he pitched well for seven and two thirds, and the Yankees eventually won the game. Still two and two. A year ago this month, he was searching for radio descriptions of LCS and World Series games pitched by his brother LeVon Hernandez. Said he couldn't pick up a television signal, trying to get the game on the radio, was able to get parts of it during Hernandez's starts. Diaz waited on that one and lined it to left, but Curtis is right there. So Orlando Hernandez works a perfect seven. He has to try to shut out to this point. Xerox invites you to keep the conversation going. Share the knowledge. Well, every strikeout tonight has been a swinging strikeout. The guys are a little bit more aggressive. They're not taking any. And contrast that to the first game when David Wells had five of his first six punch outs were call strikeouts. Now in the eighth, as the Yankees look to pad their lead, they'll send up Jeter, O'Neill, and Williams against Burba. The Cleveland bullpen continues to excel in this series. They asked Poole to get one out in a crucial situation. He banned O'Neill. Burba has come through every time he's been called upon. First in the division series, now in the LCS. 0-2 to Jeter. now 0 for 4 tonight and under 200 in the series. Well, first pitch fastball right on the outside corner. Second pitch fastball on the outside corner. Third pitch is a splitter. And he swings at it down in the dirt for strike three. And another swinging strike. David Wells the only one who can get him called. There's David. Strike to O'Neill. Ball hasn't given the fielders any work tonight. Homer walked, struck out. One and one. Berber has come on and struck out four of the eight hitters he's faced. Each team has only three hits. All strike two and two. Two down of the Yankee eighth, and a reminder that tomorrow at 2 Eastern, you can watch the final round of the 
Buffalo Championship at Kings Mill from Williamsburg, Virginia. David Duval is in the lead as they head for the final round, which you'll see tomorrow at 2 Eastern here on NBC. Paul O'Neill still upset with Larry Young, the plate umpire. He thought the called second strike was outside. Bernie Williams. Ball one to him. Still yelling at Young. I think he said that's why I swung at it. The pitch was low, the 2-2 pitch on which he grounded out, and he yells back at Young, that's why I swung at it. Sarcastically meaning, hey, you're going to call everything a strike, I'm forced to swing at junk. Still glaring at him. And Young returning the gaze. Young was staring right back at him in the Yankee dugout. Well, Dave Berber's been throwing strikes. He's been getting ahead of the hitters and getting him to swing at that splitter. Williams has grounded out and walked twice. That's out of play. just missed. He's throwing exceptionally well tonight. For the third straight time, Bernie Williams strolls to first on a walk. Considering the way the Yankees have played it tonight, running at every opportunity, with the speedy Williams on and two out, you can look for him to go if he gets a chance. Billy Davis has had an RBI double in three trips. Fastball inside. Ferba does not have the high leg kick, so he's not going to give you a great opportunity to run if you're Bernie Williams at first base. Pitching coach Mark Wiley heads out toward Burba. A lot of times the pitching coach will be sitting on the bench and he'll just notice something in your delivery. Maybe that you're rushing, you're getting your arm too far behind you. A lot of little things that we may not even notice from up here, but he sees those things because he's so used to watching Burba get a picture in your mind of how he should be delivering the ball. Larry Young is headed out toward the mound to tell him to break it up and get going. We're at the top of the eighth. There have been only three runs scored and only six hits total, and this game is just about three hours old. We're able to listen in on some of what was said at the mound conference. Yeah, we have a, we have, you're missing all my signs I'm given. I don't know what was going on. We never threw a split to that guy with two strikes, and I called it like three times. Just remember, when, when my hand's on my knee closest to you, I want it inside the either righty or lefty. Yeah. But the way, uh, yeah, because it seems like, going, are you going to actually miss that call? Well, what they're doing is calling some pitches for Diaz instead of letting, Sa you know, Sandy Alomar Jr. call his own pitches. Davis wraps it to second. Wilson tosses him out. So Burba and the Indians are out of the eighth. And it remains a 3-0 game. In their 
most critical game of the season to date. The Yankees lead 3-0, trying to draw even at two games apiece in this LCS. Well, a lot of people have wondered how the Yankees would respond being down two games to one because they had not been down the entire season. Well, so far, I'd say the pitchers have responded very well, meaning Orlando Hernandez, he has responded very well. The hitters have not put many numbers on the board. They've been able to score three runs, but have not hit well. And Hernandez falls behind the number nine hitter, Enrique Wilson, 3-0. Wilson is a switch hitter who at 256 lefty. He draws a four-pitch walk. He was a 373 hitter right-handed in limited duty, admittedly, at the major league level this year. Rivera and Stanton getting ready. Ideally, they'd like Hernandez to get through the eighth and then hand the ball to Mariano to close it in the ninth. Well, he's lost a few more miles per hour on his fastball. He was down to 86 miles an hour on a couple of pitches there. He had been up around 92 in the early part of the game. And Scott Gross is just taking some time to give Hernandez a breather and then to uh, give the pitchers in the bullpen a little more time to warm up. This worked out great for Hargrove with Wilson drawing the walk. You might have been thinking about a pinch hitter, but here's who was available, really, from the left side. Only Jeff Branson, who's seldom used. Mark Witt, a switch hitter who we'd like to save for a situation where a home run might help him. And Joey Cora, another switch hitter. And Wilson started ahead of him tonight anyway. Here's Lofton as they try to get something going. I think you have to take at least one strike here if you're Lofton. Give Hernandez a chance to walk you. Or at least make him throw a few more pitches. would be Whitten. They're going to make a change right now. Stanton comes out of the bullpen to pitch to Lofton. Great work by Hernandez. Don McDuff is the pilot tonight of the Goodyear Blimp Spirit of Akron. Don and everybody at Goodwood, we thank you very much. Orlando Hernandez with reason to smile. He struck out six, he walked two, he hit a batter. And gave the Indians just three hits in seven plus innings. The walk to Wilson to start the eighth finished him. And brought Stanton out of the bullpen to face Lofton. Starts him with a strike. Stanton had the most appearances of any Yankee pitcher. He was in 67 games. Quickly 0-2. Stanton's record was 4-1. Seldom used to close games with Mariano Rivera available. He had six saves. And there's El Duque's line. Great job. I mean, three base hits and only two base on balls. One and two. Well, I'll ask it again. Off what Pettit did last night and Hernandez has done tonight, if this goes seven, who's Joe Torre's pitcher? Good, good question, but like Joe says, he remembers what Pettit did in the game against the Atlanta Braves a couple of years ago when they came back and won the world championship. So 
he's very loyal to his people so you know it's going to be a tough decision for him but after what Hernandez did today if it gets that far and everything being equal you know you have to think about it if you're Joe Torre you have to think about starting Hernandez I should say that'll make the seats down the left side what Pettit did for Torrey in Game 5 of the 96 World Series in Atlanta was out to John Smoltz, one to nothing, as the Yankees took a 3-2 edge back home and then won it all in the sixth game. But more recently, he's been shelled by the Indians three times in postseason play, twice in last year's division series, last night in Game 3 of the LCS. Lofton lays off, 2-2. Two and two. Pettit hasn't just lost those three playoff games to the Indians. He's been pounded in them. The Indians a hit, walk, or error away from bringing the tying run to the plate again. If you're Joe Torrey, you're thinking, well, if I can win this ball game tonight, get back to 2-2. I have David Well tomorrow and David Cohn on Tuesday. He's thinking maybe I don't get to game seven. I'm sure that's what he's thinking right now. If he can win this ball game today, it may not go seven. Call strike three. part of the plate. Kenny Lofton was able to fight off the fastballs that were up. This one is down. And he's called out. Kenny seemed to think this pitch was away. And Wells thinks that's a great pitch. Vizquel, that's righty and takes a ball. Justice is on deck. And Justice has gone back to that elbow pad that a lot of the hitters wear on their front arm. Rip to left. A base hit that brings the tying run to the plate. The third hit of the night for Omar Miskell. And it raises the possibility that we'll see Rivera before the night. Well, if Miskell can hit a fastball if he gets the ball up. High fastball, and he rips it in the left field for a base hit. Good hitting, and that's his job in this situation. Get on base for the big guys. Lefty Stanton will work to justice. The right-handed hitting Ramirez is on deck. Possible double play. Now block to Jeter for one. They're on the first, and they turn it. The Yankees three outs away from evening the series. On to the ninth. Martinez, Posada, and Curtis against Burma. Martinez, after his last at bat, when we talked about him being upset, I think he actually said something very positive to himself. And that is, what am I seeing out there? Meaning that he's not seeing the ball. So your first thought should be to go out there and make sure you see the ball well. We take it for granted that a hitter sees the ball, but you really have to concentrate and focus on seeing it. Two balls and a strike. Officially tonight, Martinez is just 0 for 1. He had a walk, a stolen base. And when Lofton was charged with an error, dropping his fly ball to center field, Bernie Williams was tagging. They assumed he would have scored from third, so it's ruled a sacrifice fly. He takes this one down the left field line, in there, for what he hopes is a slump-breaking base hit. On his way to second, leadoff double. Well, sometimes you can talk yourself out of a slump, and like I said, when he said 
see the ball. I think that was the important thing for him. And he, made, he took a couple of pitches so he could see the ball, make sure he was focusing. He gets a fastball away because he's ahead in the count, and he doesn't try to pull it. This goes the other way. Nice swing and great result. Yankees, like the Indians, now have just four hits. Homer Bush is going to come in and run for Tino Martinez. And let's see how they greet him when he comes to the dugout. Well, they know how important he is to their offense. And like I said, one swing can get you started if you're a hitter. One swing can be a slump breaker. Here's Posada. Taking a strike with the lightning fast. Homer Bush dancing around now off second base. Blocked by Diaz and Bush isn't going anywhere. Fortunately for Cleveland, three of their four hits belong to Vizquel. He's three for four. The rest of the team is one for 23. They may have had their best chances in the first when Tommy fly to deep right with two on, and a moment ago in the eighth when Justice was the tying run at the plate and grounded into an inning-ending double play. Driving Manny Ramirez of a shot at it as he waited in the on-deck circle. Well, Posada's job now is to make sure he advances the runner. He'll be trying to pull the ball to the right side. That's an important run out there for the New York Yankees. Lines it to right, and it's taken by Ramirez. That ball was stung but right at Manny. Another reminder, we're back here tomorrow afternoon, 4 Eastern time, 4 game 5, Wells for the Yankees, OJ for the Indians. And unless Cleveland rallies in the ninth, it comes down to a best 2 out of 3. Curtis now with Broaches waiting next. Fastball upstairs. When you look at this Yankee lineup, I mean, I really think they missed Daryl Strawberry a lot more than they even thought they would. Terrific home run per time at bat ratio for them. And for a while, the incredible play of Shane Spencer lessened the impact of Darrell's departure because of illness. But there's no question that he gave them a presence. There's Spencer. Bench tonight in favor of Curtis, who's at the plate right now. Even if Darrell wasn't in the lineup, knowing he was there on the bench, the opposing manager often had to manage around the possibility of Strawberry coming up to pinch hit. The ball gets away from Diaz, goes all the way back to the screen, and Bush takes third. this accomplishes what Posada couldn't do. Looks like it's a splitter, but it's so far outside that there was no chance for Diaz to block it. He tries to get over there. As a splitter, he can't get there. He tried, but that ball is so far outside he had no chance of blocking. 
and it's ruled, of course, a wild pitch. One more point about Daryl. I mean, Daryl could also get hot and carry you. And when you're in a slump like this, the more guys you have that can carry you for a day or two at a time, the better chance you have of coming out of the slump as we look at Austin Bonker and Shuey in the bullpen. And Daryl could definitely do that. The infield has to come in. try anything to get this run home so don't be surprised if they put a squeeze on and Burba steps off but I think he stepped off because they were giving him a pitch outside and he didn't want he didn't understand they didn't know why now he works to Curtis and there is the pitch out and Bush goes diving back to third, although Diaz didn't throw. Well, pit, you know, pitchers, if you watch them closely, they will give away pitch outs a lot of times because they were trying to give him the pitch out sign, and he was looking in like, well, what is that for? And so he gives that away. I mean, it's, it's very simple, and I know Hargrove's upset about it because that alerted the Yankees to the fact that they something was on. He saw Mike shake his head a little bit. What's the point? Yeah. If you've tipped everybody in the ballpark off. This is a 3-1 pitch. Well, an intentional walk in effect. Right. Well, he did square around, you know, the pitch before, and they, they had it figured, but they couldn't make, the, make it work. They figured if they kept it on, they've got Bush coming down the line from third. If they walk Curtis, they don't care. We'll be back. And we saw Dave Berba confused with the, the pitch out, but here's the safety squeeze. The difference between the safety squeeze and the suicide, you see Homer Bush doesn't break. And the reason they can use a safety squeeze is because Homer Bush is so fast that if they get the ball down, he'll score easily. Most other times, you have to have the suicide squeeze because you have to put the runner in motion. Shuey comes in. Brocious swings on the first pitch. Skies won the left field. Giles right on the line to make the catch. Bush tags, comes speeding home. Throw to second. Safe there. If they had gotten him at second, Bush had crossed home plate before the tag, and the run would have counted anyway. And that's the speed of, of Bush right there. I mean, he was tagging up on a shallow fly ball, and he's able to make it. And a good job by Curtis to put pressure on the other, them to cut it off. And see, that's a shallow fly ball, really, but Homer Bush is just so fast. See how deep, he's not very deep, but he is so fast that they didn't have a chance. Good cutoff by Brocious, but not a chance at second base. Curtis heads up, moves down the second. So it's 4-0 New York. And Knobloch, who's 0 for 4, stands in with two outs. from Shuey. Well, Homer Bush comes in. They ask him to run, and he does just that. Tim Raines saying to him, I used to be just that fast, son, <laughs> but I'm 39 now. Well, he was helped out by the wild pitch to get him to third so he could score on that sacrifice fly. The Yankees may be on their way to evening the series. But they know they haven't broken out of their hitting slump. They have four runs on four hits, and except for O'Neill's home run, they haven't hit the ball all that hard tonight, or all that often. Just a reminder that after your late local news, it's a Saturday Night Live classic compilation, the best of Dana Carvey. Church Lady and President Bush ought to be heavily in evidence on the Dana Carvey special. Here's the 0-2 to Knobloch. Shuey, who has come out of the Cleveland bullpen, has thrown six postseason innings to this point and hasn't been scored upon. Oh, 
So Joe Torre, knowing that his club still isn't hitting, has tried just about everything. Well, Steals, hit and runs, had the safety squeeze on. Well, as I said earlier, that's what a manager's job is. is. When, he, when he finds out that he thinks his team is stale, you try to give him some help. Vizquel takes it on the move and throws Knobloch out. Chuck goes 0 for 5. But the Yankees may be headed for game 5, even in the series. Because the Yankees scored a run in the top of the ninth to make it 4-0, this is not a save situation for Mariano Rivera. Luis Soho is the new first baseman. After Martinez doubled, Homer Bush ran for him. Soho usually plays second base, an occasional shortstop. Actually played a few games at first this year. Started 12 games at first base. Came on late at several others and made only one error at that position. So the veteran gets his name in the scorebook in the LCS. Manny Ramirez has walked and struck out twice. Facing a pitcher he's never solved, Rivera. Against Mariano Rivera, Manny Ramirez is 0 for 8 with six strikeouts. pitch right there is why the good high fastball especially in the middle of the plate in is a weakness for Ramirez and most other hitters as well you have to lay off this high fastball you can't handle it especially from the right side high fastball he fouls it back had a pretty good swing though a ball and two strikes and Fryman to follow Ramirez in the Indian night. Even though he's 0 for 8 against Rivera, I can tell you he's glad to see him because El Duque had him thoroughly confused. Well, that doesn't help, at least from Ramirez's perspective. No. His third strikeout of the night. Well, if you're Ramirez, you're looking for something hard. Fastball, basically, and he comes with a breaking ball. This almost looks like a curveball. I mean, it, it's a slider, but it almost looks like a curveball. It had a pretty big hump in it. And watch, this has a pretty big hump, and it breaks a lot. But that's his slider over the outside corner. Toby has flied out and struck out twice. Fastball inside. As Rivera looks to conclude this game, we can't overlook what Mike Stanton did in between Hernandez and Rivera. He came on, struck out Lofton, and then after yielding a single to the scale, got justice to ground into a double play to end the eighth. That might have been Cleveland's last best chance. Bounce towards Soho. He gets a chance. Handles it flawlessly with Rivera covering. Although Mike Hargrove's team is about to be at 2 2 through four games and can't complain about that. With the exception of Andy Pettit, they haven't been able to touch the New York starters. David Wells had them shut out into the ninth. Hernandez and Cardinal able to clown at this point. David Cohn gave them just one hit. Three pitchers, El Duque primarily, and then Stanton and Rivera have them shut out on four hits tonight. This may be the best that I've seen Rivera throw, though, Bob, in a while. This doesn't bode well for Cleveland either. He's throwing the ball really well tonight. Throws to short hops it. Throws to Soho. Rivera works a quick and perfect night. And the Yankees draw even in the series. The Chevrolet player of the game is Orlando Hernandez.
the winning pitcher in his first postseason start in the major leagues after a 12-4 regular season. This is the third time the Cleveland Indians have lost to one of the Hernandez brothers out of Cuba in the last year or so in the postseason, twice in the World Series to Florida, and now here at Game 4 of the now even ALCS. The final score again, the Yankees four, the Indians nothing. Tomorrow, our day begins with the final round of the Michelob Championship at Kings Mill at 2 p.m. Eastern. Then game five of the American League Championship Series, David Wells for the Yankees, Chad O.J. for the Indians. That's tomorrow at 4 Eastern, 1 Pacific, here on NBC. Tonight, after your late local news, it's a Saturday Night Live classic compilation, the best of Dana Carvey. Now for Joe Morgan, Keith Olbermann, and Jim Gray. I'm Bob Costas, saying so long for Cleveland. We'll see you tomorrow afternoon from the Jake for Game 5.